with me in your Bibles today to the book of Proverbs, chapter 21, uh, chapter 18, Proverbs 18. Yeah, Lord, help me in Jesus' name. Uh, Proverbs 18 is our text and verse 21. Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit of it. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. The last few weeks, I've been talking about uh, the tongue, our mouth, uh, the power of our words, our speech, the things we say, how they can unite or divide, they can heal or hurt, Uh, they can... You know, a soft answer turns away wrath, Proverbs says, so they can diffuse a situation and uh, bring calm and peace. Or, if our words are sharp, we can just stir up contention. We can bring it to a whole new level. You can turn it down. Somebody, let's suppose your spouse gets in the flesh, because we know it wouldn't be you. So, But if your spouse gets in the flesh and gives you a sharp word, You have a choice. You have power right there. You have power. The power of your words. Diffuse it. A soft answer turns away wrath. Proverbs 15.1. Soft answer turns away wrath. Or you can bring it up to a whole nother level. You can bite back. You can retort in kind. Or you can, you know, you can bring the uh, insult or the offensive nature of the comment up a couple of notches. And so who wins? Only the devil wins. That's absolutely right. And we, we know all too well how, how our words can do great harm in a relationship, a marriage, a church, a family. In James chapter 1... Um, you don't have to turn here. I mean, I, I read from here last week, but James 1 and verse 26. You remember this verse? If any man among you seem to be religious and bridles not his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is vain. If any man seems to be religious, the word there has to do with being pious, you know, or religious. Uh, it's translated... If any man seems to fear God, have a genuine love, fear, respect for God, if he seems that way, that's the appearance, but they have no control over their tongue, then the Bible says they deceive their own heart, their own selves, they deceive themselves, and their religion is empty. It's, it's an empty bottle. They, they have the bottle, but there's, the contents are gone. You know, that's a powerful statement. And the tongue, having our tongue under control is what makes the difference. We we looked last week at James 3. I'm just going to highlight just one or two things because you can never really hear this enough. If he says, James 3, 2, for in many things we offend all, we all tend to uh, stumble uh, make mistakes, sometimes say something we shouldn't. But here's what the Bible says, James 3, 2, If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. That is, complete man. Not, you know, not sinless perfection. Nobody's sinlessly perfect. But the word there is mature, one who is developed, one who has matured in their faith. If they don't use their tongue in an offensive way, They have a filter so they know when to speak and what to say. You know what that's called? Maturity. Maturity in the Lord. Maturity in the Lord. That they know when to zip it and they know when to unzip it. And then they know to speak temperately, encouragingly, as we've talked about over the last few weeks. 
There's a real necessity in each of us as believers for some self-control. Yeah. Amen. You, can, you can control your, your temperament. Yes, you can. You can restrain your tongue. We can crucify our flesh, our pride, and our ego. And if you remember last week right here in James 3... I emphasize the destructive nature of the tongue. He says, for instance, verse 6, the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. That's some of the strongest language you'll read anywhere about the power, the capability to do harm, to do injury, uh, the tongue's power to, to injure, to harm. It's a fire, not a good fire here. Now, he's not, not talking about a campfire. He's talking about a fire out of control that's burning things up that you don't really want burned up. It's a fire. It's a world of iniquity. That's the way the tongue is. It defiles the whole body. It sets on fire the course of nature. And then these words, it is set on fire of Gehenna, of hell. We have to recognize this, that hell, the forces of hell fuel the fire. They, they what is adding fuel to the fire of a tongue that won't stop. That tongue that's biting and criticizing and condemning and complaining and murmuring and cutting and biting. Hell is adding fuel to that fire. It's hell at its source. Using that person. Satan's behind it. God help us to not be puppets of Satan. To not let him use our mouth, Amen. our tongue to bite and devour, you know, the bottom line is this. The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. We know that. It's hell that wants you angry. Hell wants you angry. Hell wants you discontented. Hell wants you murmuring and complaining about everything. Hell wants you grumbling. It is set on fire of hell. That's what our Bible says. Yes, it's destructive. Chapter 3, James chapter 3, the whole thing is about the destructive nature of the tongue. The whole thing. The one single sentence we pointed out last week that is positive in it is, is that the tongue therewith we bless God. We bless God with it. Right, but then everything else it says about the tongue is negative and destructive. This is... A powerful chapter, we have to remind ourselves of it often because we all have tongues and we're all too prone to let them run. You know, the Bible tells us repeatedly, not just here, but throughout Proverbs, as we've looked at already, that we have to take control of ourselves and take control of our tongue. And let me tell you how we do that. By yielding control to the Holy Spirit. You take control by yielding control. Because also right here in James, he says, the tongue can no man tame. It's, it's literally beyond our own ability. We need, we need the Lord to help us get control of our own self, to crucify this flesh, this self. I'll tell you, I believe it's one of the powerful things the Holy Spirit helps us do in our lives through the, the Holy Spirit's working. We control our tongue by yielding ourselves. You know how many times the Bible tells us we're to yield ourselves to God, that we're to submit ourselves to God? Over and over we're told this in Scripture. Submit yourself to the Lord. Yield yourself, yield your members as instruments of righteousness and, and not as instruments of unrighteousness. We need God's help. Yes. And don't ever hesitate to say, Lord, I need your help. Right. I need your help, Lord. 
Help me to control this flesh. Help me to crucify myself, my tongue, my, my tendency to fly off the handle at the slightest provocation. Remember, let every man be slow, swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Well... Today, we've emphasized this negative aspect of the tongue for a couple of weeks. Actually, today, I want to focus on the constructive ability of the tongue. Um, And I want us to look at a couple of verses that I I think many of us are familiar with, like our uh, context. uh, My my verse here really is Proverbs 18.21. My text for today is death and life is in the power of the tongue. I actually want to look at two main verses to deal with today that deal with uh, life and the constructive aspect of the tongue. And the verses we're going to point out, both in Proverbs, uh, have been used. I cite them regularly because they... They, uh, they give us some good, basic biblical principles. But just a, a single verse out of its context doesn't tell the whole story. It's never the whole picture. And these verses can be misused and abused. And some groups do that and take them to places that they were never intended to go. And uh, I'll explain that as we... As we go along, but Proverbs 18:21, that's actually our text. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. They that love it will eat the fruit of it. That is, those who love the, to talk, they love their tongue just going. Those that love to talk are going to have to eat their words. You know, sooner or later, you got to eat what you say. So you want to keep it sweet and not bitter. Right? One version translates it this way. Those who love to talk will have to eat their own words. Another version translates it. Those who love to talk must be ready to accept what it brings. Ah, because you know there are consequences. We, we always sow what, reap what we sow. And uh, our words can bring us pleasure or pain. They can bring us good or evil, just as we've said before. But let, let's consider this powerful, this powerful verse. Death and life. Death and life. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. The tongue. Your words have that kind of power. Uh, again, there are some... Basically, who've come out of the what, what some call the prosperity camp, who take passages and bring them to levels that they were not intended to go. But let's not neglect the powerful principles that are revealed here. Just because some people abuse verses, verses don't mean that, that we should abandon these verses or think that the whole verse is invalid, right? Uh, some people abuse a vehicle, but we still have to ride in vehicles. So. so we've talked about death being in the power of the tongue for the last couple of weeks. Death, destruction, misery, hurt, and so forth and so on. Let's consider the other half of this verse. Life is in the power of the tongue. Death and life. And this word life in the Hebrew, it's a big word. Uh, hey. That's... It's a short word, but it's a big word. Big in its meaning. It, it's translated hundreds of times in the Old Testament as life, living, uh, to live, H- hundreds of times. That's, it has to do with thriving, like the thriving of uh, springtime. The vegetation is coming out again, and everything's turning green, and flowers are starting to bud. Hey, it's got to do with Everything flourishing, like a fountain that's bubbling up with clean water, it's used in all of those ways. This particular word, life, that kind of life, 
is in the power of your tongue. It's translated sustenance, like, you know, something is bursting forth with fruit, with buds, with productivity. It actually means renewal. It means revival. All of this, life, is in the power of your tongue. Uh, when Joseph's brothers, we studied the life of Joseph a while back. You might remember they went to Egypt and they met the prime minister, Joseph, their brother that they had sold into slavery. Well, when they got all of that revelation, he revealed himself to them. They came back to their father, Jacob, and they came back with news. And they tell their dad, Genesis 45, they said, Dad, Joseph is alive. Joseph is alive and he's governor over all of Egypt. The word alive, Joseph is alive, it's this word, okay, to live. He's alive, he's healthy, he's strong, he's thriving, he's governor. This same word. It's, it's a very interesting word. And one of the ways that it's used, I find also interesting, is it's translated joyfully in Ecclesiastes 9.9. 9. You don't have to turn there, but, but listen to this. Live joyfully. With the wife whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity (laughs) that he's given you under the sun. Live joyfully. Joyfully is this word k. Happy, thriving, joy. Here's my point. When he says death and life is in the power of the tongue. Life means all of those things. Life, to enjoy, to thrive, to revive, to restore, to have joy. All of that in the power of your tongue. We know, we all know, you can bring joy to somebody with your mouth or you can bring misery. That power is in your tongue. You have that capability. You know, if somebody's unhappy in the house, it can make everybody unhappy. You know the old expression, mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. You can make people miserable, you can make people all around you miserable. We know that all too well. But life is in the power of your tongue. You can encourage them, you can bless them, you can compliment them. You can say good things. And look, life, life, you have that in your tongue to revive a person's lagging spirit. You can do that. Amen. Or you can do the opposite. A miserable person makes everybody around them miserable. Miserable dad, everybody's miserable in the house. Miserable mama, everybody's miserable. Miserable teenage kid, And everybody's happy, right? (laughs) Death and life is in the power of your words. It's the power of influence. That's, That's the point, the power of influence. Let's use our tongue in a positive manner. We can speak words of life to others, words of encouragement. Um. My dad used to say, I know you've heard the expression, if you can't say something nice, then don't say anything. If you can't be kind, be quiet. Uh, dad was a, a, an encourager. That's, that's what he did. He encouraged every place. He was always encouraging. Uh, that, that was his life. Um, it reminds me of Proverbs 31. Remember the, the uh, Proverbs 31 woman? In her tongue is the law of kindness. Kindness is in her tongue. That's a good thing. The word, by, that way, by the way, that word kindness is also translated many, many times in the Bible, mercy or mercies. In her tongue is the law of mercy. Lord, give us a merciful tongue, a kind tongue a complimentary tongue, an encouraging tongue. Because that's one thing we can all do. 
We all have the ability to encourage somebody. Every one of us has the ability to tell a brother, tell a sister, tell a kid, tell a spouse, tell them, you know what? I just want you to know I appreciate you. I appreciate you. I love you. Say something nice to them. Say something that you appreciate about them. You know what I appreciate about you, brother? And tell them. Let me tell you, it makes a difference. You know what you're doing? You're reviving. This is the life, the power of life that's in the tongue. There's a brother that calls me about every three weeks. Now, he doesn't attend our church. He's a brother in the Lord. I've known him a long time. But about every three weeks, he'll call me. He say, brother, I'm just calling to encourage you. (laughs) And that's exactly what he does. He'll say, brother, I just want you to know uh, I appreciate you. I appreciate your ministry. I appreciate your your faith and your zeal for the Lord. I appreciate all you do. And I just want to pray for you right now. Say, okay. (laughs) And so he'll pray for me and I pray for him. And he'll say, that's all. I just wanted to tell you, brother, I really love you and appreciate you and appreciate all you do in the Lord. And that's the end of our conversation. Now, you know, that's just somebody with an encouraging spirit. That's what they do. They encourage. They call and encourage. He doesn't even come to our church, lives on the other side of the lake. But, but uh, I suspect, I've never asked him, but I suspect he calls probably half a dozen people, probably ministers and others, and just tells them the same way because that's his nature. He just calls and encourages. And you know what? That's a ministry each and every one of us could have. Each and every one of us. There might be people in your workplace that maybe, maybe, you know, y'all don't have a whole lot to say to each other. Y'all just go about your business. But, you know, you can find something to compliment that person about. And and I I think it would be good if you would find something positive to say to that person. Find something positive to say about each one of them. If it's somebody you say, you could just tell them, you know what I appreciate about you? The fact That every day you're here, you're on the job, you're on the clock, you're doing your job. I appreciate that about you. Amen. That's right. I appreciate the fact that you're responsible or reliable. Amen. You can use your tongue in a positive way every time you pray for somebody. Every time you witness to somebody. Every time you... Tell them, you you know what, I'm praying for you. I I love you, brother or sister. Just You're in my heart. You're in my prayers. You're in my thoughts. You share with them, and you're using your tongue for good. and You're using it to bring life because Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 12 says, The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious. But the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious. God help us to be wise. You're right. Life and death is in the power of your tongue. Sometimes uh, I'll have people say, you know, Brother Rusty, I just don't know what my ministry is. I know the Lord has a ministry for me, but I don't know what it is. Well, how about it starts with praying for people, praying for one another, praying for those in the body going through trials. How about it it just be that you become an encourager? That's something each and every one of us can do. You know what I can do? I can encourage. I can tell people I appreciate them. I can tell people something positive about them that I, if you can't find anything positive to say about them, you you think a little harder. (laughs) We'll find something, right? Everybody everybody can be appreciated. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. I know people carry that to absurd Uh, level sometimes, but there is a biblical principle here. The biblical principle is use your tongue's influence for good. All right, I have a second word I want us to look at, or a second verse here in Proverbs. This is Proverbs 23. If you'd make your way over there, I want to read a verse here. 
Proverbs 23. I want to read verse 7. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. I've cited this verse more times than I could count, emphasizing the fact that uh, we have to be careful what we think. Uh, we do, however, have to realize that there are some who'll take a passage like this and uh, lift it totally out of context and even out of the the general principle that it conveys, and uh, they'll try to make it say things it does not say, and I'll, I'll get to that also in just a minute. But basically, you could say, well, this means you are what you think you are. As he thinks in his heart, so is he, right? right. Well, that's the general idea. It's just not the whole picture. Um, but... Here's how we've used it in the past, and I believe it's a valid principle. You know, if you think uh, negative thoughts, if you think, you know, that you're just miserable and unhappy and sick and incapable of doing something, and, uh, you know, if you think you can't, you can't. If you think it's impossible, then, you know, it's hard to rise above the level of what you think. Uh, or what you believe, it's hard to rise above that level. If you just have a defeatist negative attitude, then how are you going to overcome that? Sometimes it's not our circumstances that defeat us, but our attitude towards them. Uh, we just give up before we get started. And, you know, as you think in your heart, so are you. Uh, sometimes I do believe that people let a, a, a negative outlook, a negative attitude and negative words defeat them before they even get started in a, in a project. Um, Amen. Amen. I could add some other verses that I've used in the past uh, to convey a general principle, like, like Proverbs 6.2, thou art snared with the words of your mouth. You're snared with the words of your mouth. Thou art taken with the words of your mouth. That's that's a general principle. You can say things that, that become a snare to you. Uh, yeah. And then you can take that to a whole other level so that you would never say anything that would be construed as negative by anybody. And they say, oh, you just confessed it, now you possess it. So you're snared by the words of your mouth. And, uh, uh, but I don't want anyone to misunderstand me. I don't believe there's any virtue in being negative. Uh, I don't believe there's positive power in negativity. Uh, I believe there are general principles that we can take from Scripture and, and confess the Word of God, just believe what God says, confess what God says. Uh, a negative outlook on life, negative words, negative speech, negative attitude, all of that, you know, is actually contrary to, uh, by, just by general principle, it's contrary to Christianity. By general principle, Christians are supposed to be an upbeat people. I mean, after all, we are saved, washed in the blood, delivered uh, from the power of hell and Satan. We've been redeemed. Uh, our sins have been washed away. Uh, we're heaven bound. I mean, that alone should make us joyful, don't you think? We, we shouldn't be negative, grumbly people with a terrible outlook and, and so forth. I, I believe, just as the scriptures tell us, we're supposed to be joyful. We're supposed to be a singing people, a, a thankful people, a, a happy people, a praising people, trusting God, standing on his word, no matter what our circumstances are. Amen. Amen. You know, there are not, not a few verses or not just dozens of verses, but hundreds of verses that tell us that our general attitude should be upbeat and positive. Even... Even when our circumstances aren't so great. Psalms 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. 
all ye lands. Make a joyful noise. It doesn't say make a mournful noise or complaining noise or grumbling noise. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, some of you. All ye lands, serve the Lord with sadness. No, serve the Lord with gladness. (coughs) Come before his presence with complaining. No, come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It's he that's made us, not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. You know what we're supposed to be? A happy, praising, joyful, thankful people. So it's contrary to the very nature of Christianity to be negative. Negative in outlook, negative in attitude, negative in words. Be not drunk with wine, Ephesians says, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. He says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. And and look, here we go. We're to be a singing people, a praising people, a a gracious people, a kind people. Philippians 4.4. Rejoice in the Lord occasionally. That's right. That's right. Always. Rejoice in the Lord when you feel like it. No, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. We should be a rejoicing people so that we're upbeat, we're positive. In our, it's a general principle. Right. That's, that's the point. And the general principle also is that we should be thinking on things that are good, not on all the negativity in the world, right. Philippians 4, 8, whatever things are true and honest and just and pure and good report and praiseworthy. Think on those things. I do believe that it's important for us to have a positive biblical outlook and that our words should reflect that outlook. I believe we should be positive about God's faithfulness. I believe we should be confessing God's faithfulness. God's faithful. No matter what our circumstances are, God's faithful. God's in control, no matter what's going on in the world. God reigns. We sing about it. We don't always act like it, but... I believe we should say things like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We don't say in ourselves, we're not boasting in ourselves, our abilities or strength or power or capability, but we can say, you know what, through Christ, I can do all things. It's always through Christ. I can do all things through Christ. Uh, who gives me the strength. I, I believe we should say positive things. God is faithful. He'll do what he's promised. And Amen. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Say that. Amen. Uh, Thank you, to you. Right. you know, the fact is, true faith, real faith, biblical faith, there is an element of confession, what we say, that's involved with it. I mean, that's revealed all the way back in the very beginning, Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart, man believes to righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made into salvation. With the mouth, confession is made into salvation. With the mouth, confession is made into salvation. There's an element of what we say involved in salvation itself. You know why that is? It's because what we believe in our heart, if it's really in our heart, It's going to come out of our mouth. You will confess your faith. I am a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe he's washed me from my sins. It's just going to come out of your mouth. Isn't that a positive thing? Uh, I do believe, on the other hand, that some have taken some of these passages like this... uh, Death and life's in the power of your tongue. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. I believe it's possible to take some of these things and bring them to levels they were never intended to go. Uh, They twist these things, remove them from their context. And uh, the prosperity boys have latched hold of them. And they twist them to 
apply it to the acquisition of worldly wealth, uh, just selfish riches and, uh, you know, accumulation of gold and silver. So now they're confessing uh, vast riches and Rolex watches and airplanes and houses and lands and, and, and so forth. The whole thing's about prosperity and success in this world. But here's the problem. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Those who have, would have us confessing things that uh, are worldly focused rather than eternity focused. There's three things they ignore when they take verses like this and many others we could cite, but they take them out of context. They ignore three things. Number one, they ignore all the verses that deal with materialism. You see... You can't take one verse out of its context, build a doctrine on it, and ignore everything else the Bible brings to bear on the subject. The Bible says, Beloved, I would above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. That's a great verse. I like that verse, 3 John 2. But you know, to yank it out of its context and then just say, Beloved, I wish above all things that you would prosper. God wants you to prosper. God wants you to be rich. God wants you to be fabulously rich. God wants to take all the money away from the heathen and give it to you. He wants you to have that mansion. He wants you to be driving the Rolls Royce and the Mercedes and the $150,000 car. He wants you to have your own private aircraft because you are king's kid. You know, they can almost make it sound, well, hey. Makes it sound pretty good. And let me tell you how you achieve this. First, you send me your money. That's number one. Send me your very best offering because, you know, you can't reap what you haven't sown. So, you know, you got to send me some money first. And then your seed is going to grow and uh, you're going to prosper if you say all the right things. But they never cover the verses that deal with materialism. Isn't that interesting? They never talk about the Lord when he said, uh, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. All of their focus is on the world. Oh, when the Bible says, labor not to be rich. Oh, when the Bible says, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. Oh, like when the Lord said it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And that's not even beginning to mention some of the things he talks about over here in 1 Timothy chapter 6 when he says, They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts that drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after... They have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. How come they never preach on that? So there's a lot of things that they ignore. They'll point to the prosperity element. God wants you to be rich. God wants you to be rich. And for you to be rich, you send me money. Another thing they do is they ignore the verses that deal with personal holiness. You just don't hear these guys preach on holiness. You don't hear them preach on the cross, taking up the cross, denying self. Denying self, they're talking about indulging self. It's all about self-indulgence, self-aggrandizement. It's not about denying yourself. Uh, It's not about taking up a cross. It's not about personal holiness. I had... Somebody just recently, uh, they, they know I'm a preacher. This is not a person that comes to the church, but they know I'm a preacher. So they said, they said, you know, the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. And, uh, and I said, well, there you go. You know, they, were, they had a nice new vehicle and they were really happy about that. And they don't see any contradiction that... Uh, They were living with their boyfriend. There's no connection. They make no connection to personal holiness. It's all about if you confess it and if you sow your money, you will reap it. You confess wealth and riches. You want that Rolex, then you confess. 
I got a Rolex. God's given me a Rolex. You get what you say. I think I'm rich. Think and grow rich. Who wrote that? Napoleon Hill? Somebody like that. You know, the positive thinking guys, you know. If you think you're rich, you'll be rich. You have to. They, they fail to take things in, uh, in its context as well. You know, uh, beloved, I would above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Whoa, wait a minute. So you mean your soul's supposed to prosper. And, well, that's actually the context when John wrote that. He said, just as your soul, as you are spiritually flourishing, I see you flourishing and growing in faith. May you prosper in all ways, just as your soul is prospering, in, in equal measure. But they conveniently leave that out. And then there's the element of taking things totally out of their context and, uh, and try to make it say something it doesn't say. For instance, y'all still with me in Proverbs 23? As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. There is a general principle here. Uh, Let's not isolate it from, from its context, uh, even though there is a principle that I think transcends con its context, but you still have to tie it to the context. So, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. You are what you think you are. Well, is that true? Really and truly, is it true? You are what you think you are. Is it true? Is it false? Well, let's just say this. It's not the whole picture. Don't extract it from its context to make it seem like it says something it doesn't say. If we say you are what you think you are, guess what you just gave credulence to? Right. The whole LGBT movement. You think you, you are what you think you are. You gave credulence to Bruce Jenner, yeah. who said, I think I'm a woman. Yeah, right. He's a grown man. Yeah. But in my heart, I'm a woman. In my heart, I'm a woman. And so he put on a dress and high heels and had some hormone injections. And now he claims he's a woman. Changed his name. Uh, but, you know, he's still a man in a dress. I, I mean, I, I think the man's confused and needs prayer and needs pity. He needs our prayer, needs our pity, but he doesn't get our praise. Uh, not him and not the others who, who are confused about their gender. Uh, you know, really and truly, Glamour Magazine 2015 named him Woman of the Year. Which I, I think is a complete insult to women. I mean, he doesn't have any, he has no female organs. He, he has no uterus or ovaries or fallopian tubes. He's never had a menstrual cycle. He's never been pregnant, never born a child. How can he be women, woman of the year? What did he accomplish? He put on a dress. Nicole Russell, who is a secular com uh, columnist for National Review, Politico, American Spectator, Washington Times, she, she wrote something very interesting. Just, I'm just going to read a little bit something. She said, apparently, real women can't cut it, so we've got to import men into our ranks to win awards. Yeah. Here's what she said. Jenner might feel like he's a woman. He might want to be a woman. He might be living as a woman. But thoughts do not generate biology or reality. How about that? Thoughts don't generate biology? Well, you know, she's got the chromosomes of a woman, the DNA of a woman. She, I mean, uh, of a man. He's a man. He's a man. I, I had to laugh. Even a feminist, uh, this Australian feminist, Germaine Greer, she accused uh, Glamour magazine of misogyny, you know, hating women, uh, because... Here's what she said. Now, this is a feminist. She said, 
Transgender women are not women. They don't look like women. They don't sound like women. They don't behave like women. She's absolutely right. But, look, I'm making a point. As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. You can't take that passage. You can't extract it completely from context and make it mean something that it doesn't mean. A boy who says he's a girl and wants to use a girl's dressing facilities, he's still a boy. That's uh, right. Right, absolutely. Uh, I, I don't know if you, you heard this. You can't make this kind of stuff up, but... Back in December of last year, no, the year before, a Canadian man. Now, this man's married. He has seven children. But he came to the conclusion, I, in my heart, I believe I'm a six-year-old girl. Like I said, you can't make this stuff up. So, he left his wife and his seven children to go live as a transgender six-year-old girl, uh, changed his name to Stefanki. And uh, now, now, listen to what this magazine report says. She now resides with an adoptive mommy and daddy and spends her time playing with dolls and the couple's young grandchildren. As he thinketh in his heart, so is he? No. Not when you yank it out of context like that. Don't take the Bible and yank it out of context or extract a verse and build a whole series of theology because you can justify just about anything. Uh, There's a lot of gender confusion right now in the world, but we can make it real clear. I mean... You know... That's what you are. Look, we know for, for a long time that you can't extract a verse and just build a doctrine on it. As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Um, what if a person, and you've come across people like this just as I have, what if a person thinks that he's in good standing with God when you know they're lost? They know they're not saved. They know, you know, you know how they are living. And yet they really, in their heart, think, you know, I'm okay. I'm okay with the man upstairs because you know why? Because I'm a good person. That's why. I'm a good person. I believe in God. Uh, you know, I don't go around harming people. Uh, I contribute to charity and uh, feed neighborhood dogs or whatever, you know. Uh, I'm a good person. Well... As they think in their heart. So are they saved because they think they are? No. If, if you know you're lost and repent of your sins, believe on Christ as Savior. But we have to know that all sinners need a Savior. Amen. So clarity, clarity comes with context. And if you'll give me just a few more minutes, let's look at the context of this passage of uh, Proverbs Chapter 23. Notice what he says. As he thinks in his heart, so is he. But read the rest. Eat and drink, says he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. When you back it up, the whole context of verse 7 backs up all the way to verse 29 of the previous chapter. Chapter 22, verse 29 says, You see a man diligent in his business, he'll stand before kings. He'll not stand before mean men or dishonorable men. He'll stand before kings. Here's the idea. If there is a man of skill or a person of skill, a craftsman, an artisan, somebody uh, with, with skills and talents that got them recognized by the king or some important ruler and invited to dinner. He'll stand before he's invited to dinner. And that's when you... You read in in chapter 23, verse 1, When you sit to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before you, and put a knife to your throat, if you be a man given to appetite. 
here's, here's what he's saying. Here's a guy who's just an ordinary guy. But he works hard. He's become a good craftsman. He makes an, a, an excellent product or does a great job, whatever it is he does. The king recognizes or some ruler, dignity, important man, recognizes their ability, invites him to a, a feast, invites him to a dinner. Now, here you have Joe Ordinary. He's at a table with dainties and delights, the likes of which he's never seen before. You have more food here than you've seen probably in a lifetime and here's what the, the caution is be careful here and don't start acting stupid you know stuffing things in your mouth until your mouth is that big and then you're sticking things in your pockets because you've been invited to eat at this table you don't you know conduct yourself in that kind of a manner don't be desirous of his dainties they're deceitful meat he says, labor not to be rich. Cease from your own wisdom. Don't covet this kind of stuff. Don't covet this kind of life. Don't think, oh, I wish I was rich like this. If I could just stuff a few more of these in my pocket. <laughs> he says, will you set your eyes upon that which is not? Why are you looking to set your eyes, your heart, your affection on that which is not. Which is not what? Which is not what it represents itself to be like the, the way to happiness uh, or the way to fulfillment in life. It's not that. Uh, it's not the way to contentment. It's not that. Don't set your eyes on that which is not. It's not really fulfilling. It's not really satisfying. It's not bringing contentment to your life or happiness or joy. In fact... It's not even permanent because riches certainly make themselves wings and they fly away like an eagle towards heaven. They're so unpredictable. But, you know, this great king or ruler, whoever it was who invited this man, it looks like he's got everything in the world going for him. Eat not the bread of him that has an evil eye, near neither desire his dainty meats. Here's the, here's the fact that we don't always see. These people are lost. These people are consumed with greed. These people are so consumed with an eye for this world and no eye for eternity. Don't fall into their snare. You know what the Bible says about all of these things. And then in that context, notice the rest of the, ver the, rest of the passage for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. What does that mean? I'm glad you asked. It means that while he tells you, yeah, help yourself, eat and drink. He's got this evil eye, and he resents every bite you take. His mouth says one thing, but his heart Says another, his heart is not with you. Yeah, eat and drink, but he counts what every bite costs him. Because that's the nature of these kinds of people. Eat and drink. Oh, yeah, help yourself. Yeah, stick another one in your pocket. He pretends, he pretends to make you welcome, but... It's just that. It's just a pretense. It's a show. His heart, in his heart, he resents every bite you take. In his heart, he's judging you. He's con condemning you. Now, what is the Lord going to judge? Is he going to judge the man's generosity? Or is he going to judge the man's heart? Is he generous because you ate a meal at, at his house? Or is he a miser uh, because he regrets and, and resents every bite you take? Well, here's what the Bible says. As he thinks in his heart, that's what he is. He's not generous because you ate there. In fact, he's a miser because in his heart he resented every bite you took. Wow. It's like the person who congratulates you because you got the promotion. Yeah. I'm so happy for you. I hate his guts. I wish he was dead. You didn't deserve it. I deserved it. But, oh, congratulations. So, was that sincerity? Is it your words that 
you know, is it just your words that uh, count, or is it what's in your heart that matters? See, the Lord sees the heart, right? We judge by outward appearances. And the Lord judges the heart. So, again, there are principles. As he thinks in his heart, so is he. There is a general principle there. You think you're defeated, you're defeated before you start. You can defeat yourself. But don't take that, again, to some absurd, absurd, absurd uh, length. We are what we are by birth, male or female. We are what we are by the fall. By the fall, we are left sinners and lost, each and every one of us. We are what we are by our own sins. We are in need of a Savior. We need to be rescued. We're drowning men. We need rescue. Amen. And then we are what we are by the new birth. Washed in the blood. Changed, transformed. New creations. Delivered from the old nature, the old self. The way we used to be. The way we used to live. Washed in the blood of the Lamb. And now our heart's desire is, or should be, let's grow in the Lord Jesus. Let's. Let's ask the Lord to bring us to another level of maturity. Let's ask the Lord to help us to control our tongue, control our thoughts, you know, control our minds, control our heart. Let's not get sidetracked. Let's not get brainwashed by this crazy world. And the world is crazy. You don't have to look far to realize it's crazy and getting crazier. Uh, But the Lord himself is the one who told us. To set our affections, you know, on things above. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all the things that we need. All the things. He'll just add them. He'll just add them to us. We don't have to uh, chase our own tails like a dog, you know, chasing his tail, going nowhere. We don't have to live that kind of life trying to get rich. Look, live to serve the Lord. Live to please the Lord. He'll take care of everything else. Well, I'm going to quit there. Father, we pray today that you, you would help us to, to glean something here today that we can practically apply to our lives. Help us, Lord, to recognize that, that verses, even great verses that teach great general principles, cannot be removed from other great principles or removed from their context to try to stretch them to say something they don't say. Help us, Lord, to be able to read your word with a discerning eye, to believe your word with great faith, and to stand on it, on these eternal promises and principles that we might live lives that honor and please you. This we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God.